Uh, welcome to lesson seven, the last lesson of part one. Um, this will be a pretty intense lesson. Um, and so don't let that bother you because partly what I want to do is to kind of give you enough things to think about to keep you busy until part two. Um, and so, in fact, some of the things we cover today I'm not going to tell you about some of the details. I'll just point out a few things where I'll say like, okay, that we're not talking about yet, that not, we're not talking about yet. And so then come back in part two to get the details on some of these extra, extra pieces, right? So we'll, you know, today will be a lot of material pretty quickly. It might require a few viewings to fully understand it all, a few experiments and so forth. And that's kind of intentional. I'm trying to give you stuff to, to keep you amused for a couple of months. Um, I uh, wanted to start by uh, showing some uh, cool work done by a couple of students, Reshma and NPADA01, who have developed an Android and an iOS app. Um, and so check out uh, Reshma's um, post on the forum about that because they have a demonstration of how to create a, uh, both Android and iOS apps that are actually on the Play Store and on the Apple App Store. Um, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, first, first ones I know of that are on the app stores that are using fast AI. Um, and let me also say a huge thank you to Reshma for all of the work she does, both for the fast AI community and the machine learning community more generally, and also the women in machine learning community in particular. Uh, she does a lot of fantastic work, uh, including providing lots of fantastic um, documentation and tutorials and community organizing and so many other things. So thank you, Reshma, and congrats on getting this app out there. Um, <clears throat> we have lots of Lesson 7 notebooks today, as you see, and we're going to start with the one... So the first notebook we're going to look at is uh, Lesson 7 ResNet MNIST. And what I want to do is uh, look at some of the stuff we started talking about last week around convolutions and convolutional neural networks and start building on top of them to create a fairly modern deep learning architecture largely from scratch. When I say from scratch, I'm not going to re-implement things we already know how to implement, but kind of use the pre-existing PyTorch bits of those. Um, so we're going to um, use the MNIST data set, which, uh, so urls.mnist has the whole MNIST data set. Often we've done stuff with a subset of it. Uh, so in there, there's a training folder and a testing folder. Um, uh, and as I read this in, I'm going to show some more details about pieces of the data blocks API so that you see how to kind of see what's going on. Normally with the data blocks API, we've kind of said blah, dot, blah, dot, blah, dot, blah, and done it all in one cell. But let's do them one cell at a time. So first thing you say is, what kind of item list do you have? So in this case, it's an item list of images. And then uh, where are you getting the list of file names from? In this case, by looking in a folder recursively. And that's where it's coming from. Um, you can pass in arguments that end up going to pillow, because pillow or PIL is the thing that actually opens that for us. And in this case, these are black and white rather than um, RGB, so you have to use pillows convert mode equals L. For more details, refer to the um, Python imaging library documentation um, to see what their convert modes are. But uh, this one is going to be uh, grayscale, which is what MNIST is. So inside an item list is an items attribute, and the items attribute is kind of the thing that you gave it. It's the thing that it's going to use to create your item. So in this case, the thing you gave it really is a list of file names. That's what it got from the folder. Um, okay, um, when you show images, normally it shows them in RGB, um, and so in this case we want to use a binary color map, so in FastAI you can set a default color map. For more information about CMAP and color maps, refer to the matplotlib documentation, and so this will set the default color map for FastAI. Okay, so our image item list contains 70,000 items, and it's a bunch of images that are 1 by 28 by 28. Remember that PyTorch puts channel first, so they're one channel, 28 by 28. You might think, well, why aren't they just 28 by 28 matrices rather than a 1 by 28 by 28 rank 3 tensor? It's just easier that way. All the 
Conv2D stuff and so forth works on rank three tensors. So you want to you want to include that uh, unit axis at the start. And so FastAI will do that for you even when it's reading one channel images. So um, the dot items attribute contains the thing that's kind of read to build the image, which in this case is the, is the file name. But if you just index into an item list directly, you'll get the actual image object. Okay, and so the actual image object has a show method, and so there's, there's the image. So once you've got an image item list, you then split it into training versus validation. Um, you nearly always want validation. If you don't, you can actually use the dot no split method to create a kind of empty validation set. You can't skip it entirely. You have to say how to split, and one of the options is no split. Right? And so remember, that's always the order. First, create your item list, then decide how to split. In this case, we're going to do it based on folders. In this case, um, the, the, the validation folder for MNIST is called testing. Um, so in kind of fast AI parlance, we use the same kind of parlance that Kaggle does, which is the training set is what you train on. The validation set has labels, and you do it for testing that your model's working. The test set doesn't have labels and you use it for doing inference or submitting to a competition or sending it off to somebody who's held out those labels for, you know, vendor testing or whatever, okay? So just because a folder in your data set is called testing doesn't mean it's a test set, right? This one has labels, so it's a validation set. Um, okay, so if you want to do inference on lots, you know, lots of things at a time rather than one thing at a time, you want to use the uh, test equals in, in fast AI to say this is stuff which has no labels and I'm just using for inference. Okay, so um, my, my split data is uh, a training set and a validation set, as you can see. Uh, so inside the training set, there's a, par uh, a folder for each um, image, uh, for each class. Um, so now we can take that um, split data and say label from folder. So first you create the item list, then you split it, then you label it. And so you can see now we have an X and a Y, and the Y are category objects. A category object is just a, a class, basically. Um, so if you index into a label list, such as ll.train as a label list, you will get back <coughs> an independent variable, independent variable, X and Y. So in this case, the X will be an image object, which I can show. Uh, and the Y will be a category object which I can print. That's the number, it's the number eight category, and there's the eight. Um, next thing we can do is to add transforms. In this case, we're not going to use the normal get transforms um, function because we're doing digit recognition, and digit recognition, like you wouldn't want to flip it left, right, that would change the meaning of it. You wouldn't want to rotate it too much, that would change the meaning of it. Also, because these images are so small, kind of doing zooms and stuff is going to make them so fuzzy as to be unreadable. So normally for small um, images of uh, digits like this, you just add a bit of random padding. So I'll use the random padding function, which actually returns two transforms, the bit that does the padding and the bit that does the random crop. So you have to use star to say put both these transforms in this list. Uh, so now we can call transform. This empty array here is referring to the validation set transforms. So no transforms for the validation set. Um, now we've uh, got a transformed labeled list. We can pick a batch size and choose data bunch. We can choose normalize. Um, in this case, we're not using a pre-trained model. So there's no reason to use image net stats here. Um, and so if you call normalize, like this, without passing in uh, stats, it will grab a batch of data at random and use that to decide what normalization stats to use. And that's a good idea if you're not using a pre-trained model. Okay, so we've got a da data bunch, and so in that data bunch is a data set, which we've seen already. Um, but what is interesting is that the training data set now has data augmentation because we've got transforms. So plot multi is a fast AI function that will plot the result of calling some function for each of this row by column grid. Uh, so in this case, my function is just grab, and, grab the first image from the training set 
And because each time you grab something from the training set, it's going to load it from disk, and it's going to transform it on the fly. Right? So people sometimes ask, like, how many transformed versions of the image do you create? And the answer is kind of infinite. Each time we grab one thing from the data set, we do a random transform on the fly. Okay, so potentially you, every one will look a little bit different. Uh, so you can see here, if we plot the result of that lots of times, we get eights in slightly different positions because we did random padding. Um, you can always grab a batch of data then from the um, data bunch, because remember a data bunch has data loaders, and data loaders are things that you grab a batch at a time. And so you can then grab a X batch and a Y batch, look at their shape, batch size by channel by row by column. Um, all fast AA data bunches have a show batch, which will show you what's in it in some sensible way. Okay, so that's a quick walkthrough of the data block API stuff to grab our data. So let's start out uh, creating a simple CNN, a simple confident. So the input is um, 28 by 28. So <clears throat> let's define, I like to define when I'm creating architectures a function which kind of does the things that I do again and again and again. I don't want to call it with the same arguments because I'll forget, I'll make a mistake. So in this case, all of my convolutions are going to be kernel size 3, stride 2, padding 1. So let's just create a simple function to do a conv with those parameters. So each time I have a convolution, it's skipping over one pixel, so it's doing jumping, jumping two steps each time. Uh, so that means that each time we have a convolution, it's going to halve the grid size. So I've put a comment here showing what the new grid size is after each one. So after the first convolution, we have one channel coming in, because it's, remember, it's a grayscale image with one channel. And then how many channels coming out? Whatever you like. Right? So remember, you always get to pick how many filters you create, regardless of whether it's a fully connected layer, in which case it's just the, the width of the matrix you're multiplying by, or in this case with a 2D conv, it's just how many, how many filters do you want. So I picked eight, and so after this it's stride two, so the 28 by 28 image is now a 14 by 14 feature map with eight channels, so specifically therefore it's an eight by 14 by 14 tensor of activations. Um, then we'll do batch norm, then we'll do ReLU. So the number of input filters to the next conv has to equal the number of output filters from the previous conv. Um, and we can just keep increasing the number of channels. Um, because we're doing stride two, it's going to keep decreasing the grid size. Notice here it goes from seven to four, because if you're doing a stride two conv over seven, it's going to be kind of math.ceiling of seven divided by two. Um, batch norm ReLU conf, we're now down to two by two. Batch norm ReLU conf, we're now down to one by one. Right? So after this, we have a um, batch size, uh, uh, a picture map of, um, let's see, 10 by one by one. Um, does that make sense? We've got a grid size of one now. So it's not um, a vector of length 10. It's a um, rank three tensor of 10 by one by one. So our loss functions expect generally a vector, not a rank three tensor. So you can chuck flatten at the end, and flatten just means remove any unit axes. So that will make it now just a vector of length 10, which is what we always expect. So that's how we can create a CNN. Um, so then we can turn that into a learner by passing in the data and the model and the loss function and if optionally some metrics. So we're going to use cross entropy as usual. So we can then call learn.summary and confirm. After that first conv, we're down to 14 by 14. And after the second conv, 7 by 7, and then 4 by 4, 2 by 2, 1 by 1. The flatten comes out calling it a lambda, um, but that, as you can see, it gets rid of the one by one, and it's now just a length 10 vector for each item in the batch. So a 128 by 10 matrix of the whole mini batch. Um, so just to confirm that 
this is working okay. We can grab that um, mini batch of X that we created um, earlier. There's our mini batch of X. Um, pop it onto the GPU and call the model directly. Remember any PyTorch module, we can pretend it's a function. Uh, and uh, that gives us back, as we hoped, a 128 by 10 result. Okay, so that's how you can directly get some predictions out. LR find, fit one cycle, and bang. We already have a 98.6% accurate um, uh, ConvNet, um, and this is trained from scratch, of course, it's not pre-trained, we literally created our own architecture. It's about the simplest possible architecture you can imagine, 18 seconds to train. So that's how easy it is to create a, a pretty accurate um, digit detector. So let's refactor that a little, um, rather than saying conv batch norm ReLU all the time, um, FastAI already has something called conv underscore layer, which lets you create conv batch norm ReLU combinations. And it has various other options to do other tweaks to it, but the basic version is just exactly what I just showed you. So we can refactor that like so. So that's exactly the same neural net. <coughs> and so, you know, let's just train it a little, little bit longer and it's actually 99.1% accurate if we train it for all of a minute. So that's cool. So how can we improve this? Well, what we really want to do is create a um, deeper network. And so a very easy way to create a deeper network would be after every stride two conv, add a stride one conv because the stride one conv doesn't change the feature map size at all. So you can add as many as you like, right? But there's a problem. Um, um, there's a problem. And the problem was pointed out in this paper, very, very, very influential paper called Deep, Learning, uh, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition uh, by uh, Kai Ming He and uh, colleagues at, then at Microsoft Research. Um, and they did something interesting. They said, let's look at the training error. So forget generalization even. Let's just look at the training error of um, a network trained on sci 10. Um, and let's try one network with 20 layers, just basic three by three cons, just basically the same network I just showed you, um, but without batch norm. Um, uh, let's try a 20 layer one and a 56 layer one on the training set. So the 56 layer one has a lot more parameters. It's got a lot more of these stride one cons in the middle. Um, so the one with more parameters should seriously overfit, right? So you would expect the 56 layer one to zip down to zero-ish training error pretty quickly. And that is not what happens. It is worse than the shallower network. So when you see something weird happen, really good researchers don't go, oh no, it's not working. They go, that's interesting. So Kai Ming He said, that's interesting, what's going on? And he said, I don't know, but what I do know is this. I could take this 56 layer network and make a new version of it which is identical, but has to be at least as good as the 20 layer network, and here's how. Every two convolutions, I'm going to add together the input to those two convolutions, add it together with the result of those two convolutions. So in other words, he's saying, instead of saying um, uh, output equals conv2 of conv1 of x, instead he's saying output equals x plus conv2 of conv1 of x. So that 56 layers worth of convolutions in, in that, his theory was has to be at least as good as the 20 layer version because it could always just set conv2 and conv1 to a bunch of zero weights for everything except for the first 20 layers because, because the x the input could just go straight through. So this thing here is, as you see, called an identity connection. It's the identity function, nothing happens at all. Uh, it's also known as a skip connection. So that was a theory. 
right? That, that's what the paper describes as the intuition behind this, is what would happen if we created something which has to train at least as well as a 20-layer neural network because it kind of contains that 20-layer neural network. There's literally a path you can just skip over all the convolutions. Um, and so what happens? And what happened was he won ImageNet that year. He easily won ImageNet that year. And in fact, you know, even today, you know, uh, we uh, had that... Uh, uh, record-breaking result on ImageNet speed training ourselves, you know, in the last year, we used this too. You know, ResNet has been revolutionary. Um, and any time, here's a trick, if you're interested in doing some research, some novel research, any time you find uh, some model for anything, whether it's like medical image segmentation or, you know, some kind of GAN or whatever, um, you know, and it was written a couple of years ago, they might have forgotten to put resnets in, res, block, res blocks. I, 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 this is what we normally call a, a res block. They might have forgotten to put res blocks in. So replace their convolutional path with a bunch of res blocks, and you'll almost always get better results faster. It's a good trick. So at NeurIPS, which uh, Rachel and I and David all just came back from, um, and Sylvain, um, uh, we saw a... Um, new presentation where they actually figured out how to visualize the loss surface of a neural net, um, which is really cool. Uh, this is a fantastic paper, and anybody who's watching this, Lesson 7, is at a point where they will understand most of the most important concepts in this paper. You could read this now. You won't necessarily get all of it, but I'm sure you'll find it, get enough to find it interesting. And so the, the, the big picture was this one. Here's what happens if you, if you draw a picture where kind of X and Y here are two projections of the, of the weight space, and Z is the loss. And so as you move through the weight space, um, a, ResNet, a, a 56 layer neural network without skip connections is very, very bumpy. And that's why this got nowhere, because it just got stuck in all these hills and valleys. The exact same network with identity connections, with skip connections, has this lost landscape, right? So that's, it's, it's kind of interesting how, how, um, how her recognized back in 2015, you know, this shouldn't happen, here's a way that must fix it, and it took three years before people were able to say, oh, this is kind of why it fixed it. It kind of reminds me of the batch norm discussion we had a couple of weeks ago, um, of people realizing a little bit after the fact sometimes what's, what's going on and why it helps. So, um, in our code, we can create a res block in just the way I described. We create a, an nn.module, we create two conv layers. Remember, a conv layer is conv2d, batch norm ReLU, um, Sorry, conv2d, ReLU, batch norm. Um, so create two of those, and then in forward, we go conv1 of x, conv2 of that, and then add x. Um, there's a resblock function already in fast.ai, so you can just call resblock instead, and you just um, pass in something saying, how many filters do you want? So, yeah, so there's the resblock that I defined in our notebook. Um, and so with that, note, with that res block, we can now um, take every one of those, I've just copied the previous CNN, and after every conv2, except the last one, I added a res block. So this has got now got three times as many layers. So it should be able to do more compute, right? But it shouldn't be any harder to optimize. So what happens? Um, well, let's just refactor it one more time. Since I go conv2 res block so many times, let's just pop that into a little mini sequential model here. And so I can refactor that like so. Like keep refactoring your architectures if you're trying novel architectures because you'll make less mistakes. Um, very few people do this. Most research code you look at is, is clunky as all hell um, and people often make mistakes in that way. So don't, don't do that. Be, you know, you're all coders. So use your coding skills to make life easier. Okay, so there's my 
ResNet-ish architecture. And LR find as usual, fit for a while, and I get 99.54. So that's interesting because we've trained this literally from scratch with an architecture we built from scratch. I didn't look up this architecture anywhere, it was just the first thing that came to mind. Um, but in terms of where that puts us, 0.45% uh, error is around about the state of the art for this data set as of three or four years ago. Now, you know, today MNIST is considered a kind of trivially easy data set, um, so I'm not saying like, wow, we've broken some records here, people have got beyond 0.45% error, but what I'm saying is that, you know, we can't, you know, uh, 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 this kind of ResNet is a genuinely, extremely useful network still today, and this is, this is really all we use in our fast image net training still. And one of the reasons as well is that it's so popular, so the, the vendors of the library spend a lot of time optimizing it, uh, so things tend to work fast, um, whereas some more modern style architectures using things like separable or grouped convolutions tend not to actually train very quickly in practice. Um, if you look at the definition of res block in the fast AI code, you'll see it looks a little bit different to this. And that's because I've created something called a merge layer. And a merge layer is something which in the forward, uh, just skip dense for a moment, the forward says x plus x dot orig. Um, so you can see there's some, something ResNet-ish going on here. What is x dot orig? Well, if you create a special kind of sequential model called a sequential EX, so this is like the fast AI's sequential extended. It's just like a normal sequential model, but we store the input in x dot orig, right? And so um, this, this here, sequential ex conv layer, conv layer, merge layer, will do exactly the same as this, okay? So you can create your own variations of ResNet blocks very easily with just sequential ex and merge layer. Um, so there's something else here, which is when you create your merge layer, you can optionally set dense equals true. What happens if you do? Well, if you do, it doesn't go x plus x dot orig. It goes cat x comma x dot orig. In other words, rather than putting a plus in this connection, it does a concatenate. So that's pretty interesting because what happens is that you have your, um, your input coming into your res block. And once you use concatenate instead of plus, it's not called a res block anymore, it's called a dense block. And it's not called a res net anymore, it's called a dense net. So the dense net was invented about a year after the res net. And if you read the dense net paper, it can sound incredibly complex and different, but actually it's literally identical, but plus here is replaced with, with cat. So you have your input coming into your dense block, right, and you've got a kind of few convolutions in here, and then you've got some output coming out, and then you've got your identity connection, and remember, it doesn't plus, it concats, so if this is the channel axis, it gets a little bit bigger, right? And then, so we do another dense block, right? And at the end of that, we have, um, you know, all of this coming in, um, oh, sorry, we have Okay, so at the end of that, we have, you know, the result of the convolution as per usual, but this time, the identity block is that big, right? So you can see that what happens is that with dense blocks, you're, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and kind of interestingly, the exact input is still here, right? So it actually, no matter how deep you get, the original input pixels are still there, and the original layer one features are still there, and the original layer two features are still there. So, as you can imagine, um, dense nets are very memory intensive. Um, there are ways to manage this, just from time to time, you can have a regular convolution that squishes your channels back down, but they are memory intensive. Um, but, they have very few parameters. So, for um, dealing with small data sets, you should definitely experiment with uh, dense blocks and dense nets. Um, uh, they tend to work really well on small data sets. 
Also, because it's possible to kind of keep those original input pixels all the way down the path, they work really well for segmentation, right? Because for segmentation, you know, you kind of want to be able to reconstruct the original resolution of your picture. So having all of those original pixels still there is, is super helpful. So, um, so that's, uh, that's ResNets, and the main, one of the main reasons, other than the fact that ResNets are awesome, to tell you about them is that these skip connections are useful in other places as well. Um, and they're particularly useful in other places and other ways of designing architectures for segmentation. So in building this lesson, um, I, I always kind of, I keep trying to take old papers and saying, like, imagining, like, what would that person have done if they had access to all the modern techniques we have now? And I try to kind of rebuild them in a more modern style. So I've been really rebuilding um, this next architecture we're going to look at called a unit um, in a more modern style um, recently. And I uh, got to the point now, I keep showing you this uh, um, semantic segmentation um, uh, paper with the state of the art for Canvid, which was 91.5. Um, this week I got it up to 94.1 using the architecture I'm about to show you. So we just, we keep pushing this further and further and further. Um, and it really was all about, um, you know, a adding all of the modern tricks, um, many of which I'll show you today, uh, some of which we'll see in part two. So, um, what we're going to do to get there is we're going to use this unit. So we've used a unit before. Um, I've um, improved it a bit since then. So we've used a unit before. We used it when we did the Canvid segmentation, but we didn't understand what it was doing. So we're now in a position where we can understand um, what it was doing. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is kind of uh, understand the basic idea of how you can do um, segmentation. So if we go back to our Canvid notebook, um, in our Canvid notebook you'll remember that basically what we were doing is we were taking these photos and um, adding a, a, a class to every single pixel. And so when you go data.showbatch for something which is a segmentation item list, um, um, it will automatically show you these color-coded pixels. Um, so, here's the thing, like, in order to color code this as a pedestrian, you know, but this as a bicyclist, it needs to know what it is. It needs to actually know that's what a pedestrian looks like, and it needs to know that's exactly where the pedestrian is, and this is the arm of the pedestrian and not part of their shopping basket. It needs to really understand a lot about this picture to do this task, and it really does do this task. Like, when you looked at the results of our top model, it's, it's um, you know, I, I can't see a single pixel by looking at it by eye. I know there's a few wrong, but I can't see the ones that are wrong. It's that accurate. So how does it do that? So the way that we're doing it to get these um, really, really good results is, not surprisingly, um, using pre-training. So we start with a ResNet 34. And you can see that here, unit learner data comma models dot resnet34. And if you don't say pre-trained equals false, by default you get pre-trained equals true, because why not? Um, so we start with a, 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 a resnet um, 34, which starts with a, a big image. So in this case, this is from the unit paper. Now, their images, they started with um, one channel by 572 by 572. This is for medical imaging segmentation. Um, so after your stride 2 conv, you, um, they're doubling the number of channels to 128, and they're halving the size, so they're now down to 280 by 280. Um, in this original unit paper, they didn't add any padding, so they lost a pixel on each side each time they did a conv. That's why you're losing these two. Um, but so basically half the size, and then half the size, and then half the size, and then half the size, until they're down to 28 by 28 with 1,024 channels, right? So that's, that's what 